everybody, this is Josh Valentine with the Clean Coalition. Um, before we get started, just wanted to let you know who's speaking today. It's uh, John Griffiths from Contech, and Jeff Harding from Chargeless. We also have on hand John Sarter um, with the Clean Coalition. And uh, John Griffiths is going to kick us off here on his microgrid presentation. Um, just as a, a reminder, if you have never used GoToWebinar before, um, there is a chat box. Um, and a question box. If you want to quite answer a question, uh, if you want to answer, uh, ask a question, we'll address them at the end of the presentation. I just enter it only in the question uh, box in your go to webinar control panel. So uh, without further ado, I'll hand it off to John Griffiths now. Great. Well, thank you. And uh, thanks all for taking the time out on a, I'm sure, a busy Tuesday to uh, join this webinar. So, um, uh, hopefully, it will make it a, a, a useful, um, useful way to spend your time. And uh, um, we're going to talk about the Kaiser Rich Microgrid. Um, and I think as we go through, if you have any questions, as Josh said, uh, feel free to uh, enter in the chat box. It would be great to address these as we go on, or we can pick them up later. <clears throat> so uh, let's jump in here. Um, so this is a video we're showing is the actual Kaiser Richmond microgrid, which we're going to talk a lot about in this presentation. Um, and as we go through, uh, you know, Clean Coalition, and I trust this is in line with your uh, your goals, you know, accelerating the transition to renewable energy and a modern grid through technical policy and project development expertise. So I, hopefully what we're going to talk about today is in line with your goals. Uh, <clears throat> agenda, so, um, We'll get to the actual microgrid itself, which is the first eye occupancy microgrid uh, in the United States. And we're going to talk about you know, what, you know, what's driving this technology, uh, the impact of renewables and decarbonization and how this will um, help that. I'll also touch a little bit on regulation. Um, my, myself, uh, Contech and Charge Bliss, we're also uh, work a lot in healthcare and we're uh, both on the board of the Hospital Safety Committee in California, uh, which is regulating the hospital that's trying to drive this regulation. And we'll talk about systems and opportunities and how you can apply this to your project. So again, myself, I'm John Griffiths. I'm an electrical engineer. So did it many years ago as an electrician um, and now the uh, founding principal of Contact CA. We focus on electrical engineering and distributed generation and microgrids. Uh, for clients in California, but also around the world. Um, and then my, I'm also joined on this presentation by the project manager from uh, Charge Bliss, Jeff Harding. Uh, yeah, thanks, John. Uh, Jeff Harding here, the director of construction for Charge Bliss. Uh, our CEO, uh, shown here, uh, Dr. David Bliss, and our COO, John Harding, is also on the call. Um, yeah, and we we been a development team in the in the green energy space for a little over five years and uh hopefully this will be a, a good presentation josh are you there right. thank you is there a nine digit code that people can use to enter this we're having people having a hard time connecting josh do you want to share that what was the uh, question? Is there a code to dial in audio? Yeah, is that what you were referring to? That it's requesting a nine digit code. Uh, yeah. Um, well, that's probably uh, for um, audio access. Mm -hmm. The um, access code for mm -hmm. audio is 700-739-202. Okay. Okay, so the audio access code is 700-739-202. Correct. Sure, it's 700-739-202. Yes. Okay, should I keep going or do you want me to wait? Uh, no, go <clears throat> Thanks, John. That's all right. On. Okay. All right. Yeah. So, um, I just thought uh, I'll just do a quick introduction of what what a microgrid is. I'm sure many people on here are aware, but I think just for those in arm, um, 
So I, I use this uh, slide from the Department of okay, Energy. Um, nice. Right now, most buildings are connected to the macro grid, Josh, the utility, and then... Um, he said the code is no John, longer. you're not, can you mute John? Josh? Um, uh, so, sorry, so we're, right now we're connected to the macro grid, uh, most buildings, and whereas a micro grid, is connected to the macro grid or the utility through a point of common coupling. That could be a transfer switch, a smart switch, or even just a open disconnect. So micro grid has the ability to uh, um, distribute and utilize energy generated within the grid itself disconnected from the macro grid. So key components would be some source of energy, that'd be that PV, solar, um, battery, wind, um, or even uh, cars, V to B, vehicle to building, um, or in, in in many cases, you know, diesel generators. Um, so those are in our goal of decarbonization. Um, we're hoping to move away from that. Uh, so then, one of the important things that um, we should focus on today is um, a controller. And I, I I forgot that, but we'll try and pick that up as we go through. Um, and that controller will take inputs from um, other microgrids, uh, weather forecasting can storm harden. Um, I think recently, you know, even the Tesla, or those with the power walls issued a storm hardening where you would uh, not, you would increase the state of the charge in the event so you have more power available when you lose the utility. Uh, and then the other thing would be uh, utility markets. The controller would take in inputs and that would decide economic based on economics, what is the best time to charge and discharge these uh, stored assets on the site or the renewables, um, or whether it's more economic to take uh, power from the utility. So I went very quickly. Um, feel free in the chat box if you do have any questions. That, in essence, is a microgrid, a key component, uh, a point of common coupling, so you can connect and disconnect from the utility or the microgrid. You have a controller, source of energy, and inputs to the controller. And that can, can even be just be a, a time time service. So we jump, you know, I always like to start any presentation or discussion with why. Why even consider a microgrid? So just had this slide, you know, <clears throat> excuse me, some, some of the things that uh, I think from us at Contact CA and Charge Bliss, uh, you know, we have you know, climate change. You know, we're in, certainly in the Bay Area in California. We're seeing the, we are experiencing prolonged power outages as part of AB 901, where the utilities are turning off uh, utility in a planned way for a prolonged period of time, up to four days, or could even be longer. Um, you know, risk of wildfires. You know, thankfully this year has been uh, not as bad as the preceding years, but. Um, I think it's something we're going to see more of. Um, the other thing with microgrids, you know, generators. You know, the standard solution to emergency power is a diesel generator, and it's we use the term stranded asset. It, well, when it runs, it's very important, and it provides a lot of value. But you know, it's several hundred thousand dollars it needs maintaining, installing, and permitting, and designing. It's only really going to give you value in an emergency or a power outage, whereas a, a microgrid and stored energy solutions can also provide that value um, ongoing and also in if it is designed in a, to be an island in an emergency, uh, provide value in a power outage. Um, we also can better utilize the renewables, um, save money, and this is also in line with uh, climate, uh, global climate goals and corporate climate goals. So um, one of the things I just want to touch on, I, I think the really one of the other drivers for why microgrids is the duck curve. Um, I'm going to make the bold assumption this educated group are aware of the duck curve. Um, here's our favorite little logo here. Um, you know, I grabbed this, uh, these charts and hopefully it views okay on the, um, uh, on the screen here. But, you know, we have, this is, no, oh, it's actually about last year that, you know, we've got, you know, the demand curve, and then when the renewables come online around seven o'clock, we have essentially a glut of renewables because California did such a great job of deploying um, the renewables, primarily solar. Um, and then with stored energy, we are able to, uh, even on site or taking in um, 
charging from the utility, we're able to utilize or store that abundance of energy that's generated in the middle of the day and then deploy that at peak demand late in the which is now shifted significantly late in the evening. Uh, you know, we're just talking about why, you know, there's you know climate goals, um, you know, getting decarbonization. Um, and this is not just a California, I know it's a California group, but this is a global goal. I was meeting with a client in the UK uh, um, back in July, and even the UK have now have uh, decarbonization goals. And there's a lot of global interest, in, and rightly so, in climate change and decarbonizing projects and driving interest in, in microgrids, which I think, as soon as we're, one of the things I'll touch on is the economics of microgrids, is that with microgrids, uh, a big cost, you know, is cost. So as we're seeing globally more um, interest and more projects coming online, the supply chain, the global providers, Eaton, Schneider, they're going to increase the size, the market for their products. So hopefully costs will come down and we're able to deploy more. So, um, and then in preparation for this, I think I already touched on this, you know, impact of climate change. This was actually from my dining table. Um, I received, came home to a, you know, PG and E are doing a great job of uh, you know making sure people are ready for this. Um, you know, a flyer what to do in a paradise, and then actually showing the zones that I'm I'm in here, and I think probably a number of us are in these uh, climate zones one sorry zones one and two where we're going to see um, planned power outages. Another reason why we need to look at stored energy and abilities to provide power on, on our own site. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, all right. So what this presentation is really about is the Kaiser Richmond microgrid. So um, myself and Jeff um, were deeply involved in this project for a number of years. Um, the Kaiser Richmond microgrid is a California Energy Commission funded project. Uh, it is hosted by Kaiser. It's on the Kaiser Richmond Hospital site. And Charge Bliss are the... Uh, developer of this project. And, and my role was as uh, engineer record for the electrical design, but I've also been involved in a commissioning and ongoing operation um, working closely with Charge Bliss. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, you know, I have this slide. We've uh, been both feel very fortunate enough to be part of this project. And, um, uh, <clears throat> you know, the most recent one, we hosted a, a California Society of Healthcare Engineers um, group presentation, and we had probably 35 people attended. So we're seeing a lot of interest, you know, obviously in this group, but also across the industry into how we can uh, bring these solutions to keep, you know, certainly hospitals um, and essential facilities um, operating in a in a power outage, but also how do we can, um, you know, help reduce cost and optimize how we use on-site energy. So, um, I always ask who's familiar with the Kaiser Richmond microgrid, but as this is a um, webinar, I'm not, um, feel free to add it to the chat box, but uh, um, I'm going to just walk through this, um, this project. So, this is an aerial shot from Google Maps of uh, Kaiser Richmond, um, Kaiser Hospital. It's uh, just north of San Francisco, for those that aren't familiar with it. It's... Uh, it's actually the only critical access hospital in the area. Um, even when given Richmond's proximity to the Bay Area, it is a disadvantaged community. Um, and this hospital is, uh, is a very highly utilized hospital and it's a big part of the community. And so, and, and I would give recognition in, in this to the hospital. They actually worked through with us as we implemented the microgrid um, uh, in our various interconnections. So. What have we got? So, firstly, we have a, this microgrid. We have a 250 kilowatt solar array on the roof um, with the parking structure. Um, you know, I, I do think it's similar to many projects. Um, and then, then that is then connected to a one megawatt hour Samsung lithium ion batteries. Those are located in here in the lowest level of the parking structure. And then that is then connected from solar into the the batteries and that is come that is then the batteries connect to the inverter this is a three port princeton powered 
speaking 250 inverter to that has a maximum throughput of 250 kilowatts and then that is in turn controlled by the <clears throat> the controller and here's jeff um through a switchboard so um if i don't forget we should talk about the controller because it's very important this is a windows 10 controller um you know mounted in the uh, you know in a in a NEMA one box in our electrical room but this is a very very important um, part of the micro bit so we back up a little bit so in terms of operation so solar panels those will charge the batteries and then the batteries will um, depending on the time of day will then either be the inverter will decide either to take the solar energy to charge the batteries or if it's a peak event then it will deploy the energy into the building so in terms of overall um, design and uh, <clears throat> excuse me sorry if I'm talking too quickly um, so solar then that, that will then come down into the battery room inverter and then from the, the inverter one to either uh, it pulls out so the, it can also charge from the utility so this this line shows the connection to the utility into the invert through the inverter and it can charge the batteries or the controller then can decide whether to take the energy from the batteries at DC, convert it to AC, and then inject it into the emergency power, into the normal power system. So I have a couple of diagrams coming up that will show how this operates in an emergency situation. But in essence, in summary, we're taking solar energy, charging the batteries. We can also take uh, utility power um, off peak, charge the batteries for use when it's um, optimally uh, when it's optimal for the system on a hospital but we also have the ability to grid form or island the project by the use of an automatic transfer switch so if we do lose the generators uh, and the utility we are able through operation of a transfer switch <clears throat> to power the life safety branch the critical systems within the hospital using the stored energy and the solar power for a prolonged period of time um, just in terms of what does that do for economically? Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. So this is uh, you know a graph over time. You can see 2000, 2016, 2017. This is the amount of energy we're using. You know you can see the peaks mostly from cooling in September, and then as we brought the microgrid online 2018, you can see on this line we're seeing some you know appreciable um, savings here throughout the year. And in 2019, you know, this is a somewhat historic, but we're seeing the similar savings. What this doesn't show is this is savings of the you know, actual energy costs, but this is also made up of the demand charges, which uh, you know microgrid is particularly good at is um, offsetting those peaks. So, um, so this controller, uh, this is a shot of the con controller, um, and I. Let me go back here. So I'm I'm going a little fast, um, and feel free to let me know if I need to slow down. Um, so we go back here. So this is the the savings over time, and this next next is a screenshot of the controller. It may be a little difficult to see on the screen. Um, uh, this is essentially a dashboard that we have um, created by um, UC San Diego, who uh, Professor Raymond de Calfon, who's part of the team and develop our controller. So let me check the time. All right, we're coming up on 9:24. Uh, hey, John. So what does this show? Yep. Thank you. Hey, uh, you mind if I interject with a question from uh, an attendee? Sure. Um, actually, it's uh, Craig Lewis from the Clean Coalition. Um, he's asking. Hey, Craig. Uh, he's asking, does all the solar generated energy go into the battery first? Also, what is the round trip efficiency loss of energy going in and subsequently out of the battery? No. Oh. That's a good question. Um, the honest answer is I do not have a round trip efficiency. Um, Jeff, do you do you happen to know, or if we don't, we can certainly get back to you. Yeah, no, I, actually I don't. And for for the first question, actually the controller kind of makes the determination, um, so it would be shared in the morning as the so. And actually, you can see from John's graphic this top slide. The green line represents the solar production. The red line represents what the inverter is currently doing um so so 
the inverter deploying the energy into the building. So you can see it kind of follows that curve, uh, but then also picks up where it's higher than the than the green line there that's actually pulling from the storage. Uh, so so it does both. It, the the some of the some of the solar goes into the building immediately, and some goes into the battery. It's kind of shared. Uh, it's based on economics. Uh, as far as the round trip efficiency, one comment I would say. Uh, the beauty of the three port Biggie 250 is that the solar, so there's two DC ports and one AC port. Uh, so solar into battery is a per, pretty high efficiency because it's DC to DC. Um, um, but then, yeah, I'd have to get back with you on the exact uh, efficiency rate of of the, you know, DC to AC. I, I want to say around 95%, but but don't quote me on that. Hope that helps. So there's a follow-up from Craig um, asking, given the battery is designed to take energy from the grid in addition to and from the battery, does the battery qualify for 100% tax benefits? Uh, yes, I think the threshold is 25% uh, from the grid uh, to, to qualify yep. for the, for the uh, self-generation incentive. Yeah. And, um, and we, of course, we're, I'm sorry. We, of course, worked in the metrics of that into the algorithm of the controller uh, to ensure that uh, that we don't go over that threshold. Um, and, and typically, we will charge more overnight um, in the winter um, than in the summer. Uh, but yeah, that's kind of all worked into the metrics. Great. Thanks. And just um, another quick question from Malini. She's a, she's a colleague from the Clean Coalition. Um, okay. She asked, um, did you deploy the solar PV as part of this project or was it already in place? No, it was built as part of this, this project. Awesome. All right. Um, great, great, thank you. Great questions. Yeah, uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Jeff. So if I feel free to interrupt me as I go through this. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm I want to make it meaningful for uh, everyone on the audience. It's, as Jeff rightly said, so let's, I'll quickly run through these um, run through these slides and we do a time check here on 9:30. <clears throat> Excuse me. So yeah, this this so in terms of the uh, um, the inverter, so this is as you write, you'll see the solar, the green line. You know that just that starts to produce. You know this is say this is around seven o'clock. You can see this you know, standard solar curve, and then one thing you know Craig is you probably picked up here is. This is actually see negative. So this is the uh, the inverter charging using u the utility uh, using off-peak energy. Um, but that is, as Jeff already said, that it, that input is minima is optimized to not exceed the um, the uh, requirements for the uh, S chip um, grant. I think it's 20, yeah, 25 percent. So as we come through the day, <clears throat> the inverter when you know. When the, when the highest loads and the energy is the most expensive, the, the inverter red line is going to that's going to when it's deploy most energy. So what does that mean in terms of uh, this is the point of common coupling? This is the actual, I guess the the net energy in the building. So and again, I hope Pre, can you see this the mouse or I don't know if people can zoom in. I probably should have made these three slides. Um, so we've got the so the blue line is the uncontrolled. So this is the hospital's profile um, when you're uh, without, if we didn't have a microgrid. Whereas the red line is, that's the resultant, the net, the, I guess the net energy usage. So you can see here, if we didn't have a microgrid, the hospital would be using less energy because it's lower. But because it's charging here overnight, it's going to be using more energy. Whereas then we get to here when the peak energy use of the facility, that's when we're deploying most energy from the from the microgrid from the battery to offset the peak um, peak energy pricing. <clears throat> and again, this is constantly um, refining algorithm. So it's uncontrolled is the red line up to net energy, and then uncontrolled is what it would look like without it. Um, and then just as we do that, you know, part of delivering a microgrid, we had to put in some very, I would call them high fidelity metering. Um, and that gave us a, um, a couple of advantages. We actually identified some issues on one of the chillers because we could see this great big spike occurring um, during the day. And then we worked with the facility 
and they identified there was a problem with one of the chillers. So kind of a side benefit of installing a microgrid is you will actually have a, a, a really fine um, view of your electrical system and that can be used and hopefully in the future in the controllers to do some uh, diagnostics on systems. So the, the final slide, which is probably very hard to see on the screen, is the battery state of charge. So you can see that the, the blue line here, the reference, is just, but that very closely matches the measured. So, um, but it, it deviates just a little bit here as we get late in the day. So what does that mean? So really, this is good for us because our algorithm is pretty closely matching um, our reference, what we planned. And I think if any of you, maybe a takeaway from this, this is a pretty important thing to watch because we have seen when we've had some unusual weather or power usages on the site, you can see how that, you know, that, that, that will deviate through the day. Um, so last other uh, pointers on this slide before I move on. So we see maximum state of charge is 80% and the minimum. Um, so the maximum is, um, obviously we don't want to um, you know, over, overburden this, you know, the system. This is optimized to uh, get the longest life and the best performance in the batteries. But the other is the minimum state of charge. So we keep this at 41%. Um, and I mentioned earlier, uh, so this, minimum state of charge is how far do you discharge the batteries and we two drivers i have for this are obviously economic in the normal operation but we don't want to drive it too far down because what we have had is if there was a chiller or a, an elevator or some testing that occurred um, during the day that we weren't prepared for then the battery would not be able to deploy and then we would exceed the maximum uh, energy for that month and then we could be levied um, a high demand charge uh, for that month. So this optimizing this number is very important to work with your controller developer and your team. And the other thing, we're not actually doing that, but certainly on other systems as we deploy microgrids for a, a um, in, to provide you know, emergency power or backup power is when you have this call storm hardening, um, you know, in California, our major event is seismic, so you can't predict that. However, certainly with the wildfires, or if you if you're in a facility or building that had a notification from PG&E that uh, you were potentially going to be, um, you know, and they're going to turn off the utility for a period of time, you could then work with your developer or your controller to. Um, you know, not drop below 80%. So you would then be paying more for energy during that time um, and be hit with demand charges, but you know that you have the maximum stored energy for that power outage. So, um, and, and there's any other questions, I'll move to the next slide. Um, uh, yeah, John, so, uh, uh, Craig yeah. is asking, how will pg es coming to you, uh, TOU charge, uh, changes affect the battery charge discharge scheduling? Another great question, Craig. Thank you. So this is optimized for that. Um, I know uh, you know that's having a radical change. Certainly on the Southern Cal Edison, you even have critical pricing. So that is being addressed. Um, that is being addressed uh, as part of the controller. Um, and I think for the rest of the audience, um, I guess. The, I should probably have a slide. I did have a slide for that, and I took it out. You know, that, you know, traditionally, the peak time of use charge was um, midday. Now it's been moved, recognizing the, um, the abundance of renewables to, to later in the day. Um, so we have optimized for that, but certainly uh, you know, the renew any controllers, um, if anybody do, does have a controller or any demand response, they should make sure that that is updated to um, reflect the change in time of use charges. Did I answer the question? So the answer, Craig, is it? Yes, it has been optimized. Um, so I'll, um, and I'm, so we lose time for questions. Uh, so this is for those uh, electrical engineers or those interested. This is actually the single line for the hospital. Um, so in a, in a, in a, because this is a critical facility, is an essential. Um, it must be operational for 72 hours in a power outage. Um, I'll quickly run through this, but we have 
normal power source in the normal operation the power comes from the utility to the essential systems through the three branches of emergency power um, and then normally the uh, pv and battery will uh, charge or discharge through the inverter and then that will then be um, absorbed within into this into the system no different from a uh, any other solar pv system um, so then in an emergency if we lose the utility uh, in a hospital the diesel jet they have two 750 kilowatt diesel generators those will then um, power the essential um, the emergency power branches and then uh, part of rule 21 the microgrid and solar will then uh, shut down. <clears throat> However, the unique aspect of this project is that um, we are able to, through the operation of a non-automatic transfer switch, um, um, grid form the inverter and microgrid system, and then transfer the power, The we will then use the stored energy and the solar energy power to support the life safety branch, which is in the hospital is the highest uh, level of priority. That's um, fire alarm, egress lighting, and some um, uh, critical systems. And we're able to do that for, um, uh, well, we tested it for four hours and we had a, a, the ability to do it much longer. And then in a prolonged outage, um, what we have to do is because this is a hospital, uh, a lot of this is driven by the, the codes because at the moment, because this is part of the um, emergency power system, any any component needs to be seismically certified. It needs to be able to essentially not fall apart in a major seismic event. These are very resilient components um, that we've used, but they're not actually to be able to provide that in a normal power outage. But we do have the ability to support the life safety system for a, a very long period of time in that power outage. You know, should they run out of diesel, lose a generator, lose a t utility. So, uh, so with that, um, I'll just, uh, again, feel free to ask questions. I'm, I've probably gone a little quick, just be mindful of the time. Um, this is another project that myself, uh, Con Ed Contact and Charge Bliss have been involved. Um, uh, the Kaiser Richmond project is actually an essential hospital. It's eye occupancy, it's regulated by the, the state. Um, Whereas this next project we're um, going to talk about is the San Benito Clinic in um, Hollister, uh, California. Um, we we were uh, the team was approached by uh, the CEO who was um, she's Puerto Rican. She went out and helped the um, uh, in the in the event of the uh, hurricane there. She came back and said, "This is not happening on my watch." She was uh, she went to the board. They've agreed to fund um, a microgrid. Uh, so this facility can um, run uh, for, in, I would say, indefinitely using renewables on site um, and also during normal time. Uh, so with that, I'm going to hand over to Jeff, who is the deeply involved in this project. Jeff, do you want to talk us through the um, San Benito project? And uh, before I do that, this has only just gone live, so we don't have a whole lot of information, but um, uh, it's a pretty exciting project. Uh, yeah, thanks, John. Uh, yeah, so the San Benito Health uh, facility, uh, the project uh, consists of, as you can see here, th this is actually a look of the dashboard from the ELM field site uh, controller. Um, ELM is a company out of Texas that we partnered with on this project to supply the packaged controller battery uh, system. Uh, so, the, the, so the project consists of, as you can see here, uh, 86.4, 87 kilowatt of solar uh, on the roof of the hospital, a little bit over a, a megawatt hour of, of stored energy. Uh, and then that's coupled with a um, EPC 250 kilowatt uh, inverter. Uh, so we can supply at any one time um, 250 kilowatts of energy. Uh, and then that is also tied in with an existing 150 kilowatt uh, generator that was already on site and, and required by, by uh, OSHPOD regulations. Um, the, the, the hospital basically runs at um, around an 80 kilowatt uh, peak, uh, so you can see that there's enough enough energy there in the generator to not only uh, um, supply the building with power, 
but would be able to, to charge the batteries. Actually, I should back up. So, so the ideal that the hospital would like, obviously, to, to run as much off of green energy as they could physically uh, put into the building, uh, but then also have the resiliency to essentially remain off-grid uh, indefinitely. Um, um, and, and they can do that, as you can see, as you could imagine, at, at 70 kilowatts with 84 kilowatt system uh, and a 250 kilowatt inverter, that they can cover the, 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 the needs of the building uh, almost 100 uh, percent. You can see from this graph down here that breaks down the green being the renewable energy, the yellow being grid energy, and then there's a little sliver of red that is the, the, the generators. And it might be a little bit hard to see in this, but I think during generator testing uh, is when we see a little sliver over on the left. Yeah. Uh, so, so basically, yeah, well, I mean, in, even during a, a prolonged uh, duration of, of no sunlight. Oh, sorry, sir. Oh, that's okay. Um, even during a prolonged uh, time of, of no sunlight, uh, the batteries are, are being depleted. Um, then the controller would actually kick in the 150 kilowatt generator be able to supply the full building load, but then also spill over and charge up the battery. So thus prolonging the uh, the life uh, of the, I think they require four hours of diesel uh, uh, for, for this particular facility, but, but you can see by charging the battery back up, obviously the controller then would switch right back to running off battery power and, and, and dial down the generator, even shut the generator off. Uh, one other thing I guess I would note, um, this has been on for about eight weeks, uh, maybe a week or so of that was commissioning, but as you can see on the left, the total energy consumed from the facility is 34.98 megawatt hours, um, and and from that of that 35, uh, 21.85 megawatt hours has come from from uh, renewable energy. I did the math, and that's about 62% uh, of their energy needs has come from come from this system. Uh, so so yeah, I, th I think it's kind of a uh, a neat project in that um, you know this facility could could uh, not only stay open during normal business hours, but could also become um, kind of a, a a safe haven for the community uh, during uh, you know prolonged outages. All right. Well, thank you, Jeff. That's uh, yeah. I think I you know whilst the Kaiser Richmond project was a unique hospital, this I I feel I think this is a tremendous project to show that, um, you know, how you can use renewables to one, you know, you know how, how you can optimize use of renewables to operate this facility, but also this is a very resilient um, system in in what is a really, you know, key part of the community. Um, so just one thing is, a, is on a, for the electrical engineers out there, which sort of, I, I honestly hadn't realized the benefit of, um, this configuration we did the reason we have the diesel generator is you know it, it was already on site um, and it's actually recently been replaced however you know one of the problems with a generator um, is testing and to every month when you test it you need to have a maximum a minimum of 30 percent load and oftentimes that's quite difficult to achieve and if you don't get that 30 percent you get something called wet stacking and generators can not start if you don't properly maintain it and you need to add load banks However, in the way we've got this configured, when they actually run the generator, they can run it at um, an optimal load for the generator, to, um, which is very efficient use of the diesel that's possible. To use that energy, typically it's just, it, either if you have a load bank, it's just wasted as heat. But you can use that, the, uh, the, the full, full capacity of the generator, one, to charge the battery so the energy is not wasted, but also it's, Basically, the microgrid acts as a load bank. <laughs> so there are other added benefits um, for for this configuration. Uh, great. So Jeff, should I jump into the uh, you know how to apply that on the project? Did you have anything else to add for um, San Benito? No, unless there's unless there's maybe other questions or, or comments. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I wish we had more more information because this is a really great project. We do have a bunch of questions, but I'll let you get. We're already at quarter, okay. of, so I'll let you. All I'll right. let okay. you guys finish the the presentation. Right. Great. Let me uh, speed up here. So, I just put it through a couple of slides here. How to apply it to 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 your project? Um, so, when we talked about this before, I think about two two scenarios. There's a new construction, new build, greenfield site, and then there's an existing. So, 
I think really it's, you know, looking you know, as most things, if you do want to incorporate microgrid or stored energy, stored energies, look for that um, early, incorporate an early planning infrastructure. You know. Look for opportunities to uh, make, I guess, make the systems forward compatible. Um, you may not have the financing or the space, but design designing the systems ways to connect that because doing it uh, afterwards can be very expensive and particularly in essential facilities where you cannot shut the building down and you have to have backup generators and interconnections when you do that um, uh, you know these are the opportunities um, you know and again minimize legacy systems you know <laughs> I use that term for compatible but you know looking for systems and connections and interfaces that will set you up for the future because things are you know, innovations happening at a, at a rapid rate certainly in microgrid and stored energy solutions challenges funding where do you get the money regulation you know in hospitals you were we're charged bliss and contact we're working we're actually at, uh, at the state level to make sure that codes and regulations are uh, catching up to allow us to embrace these technologies and design skills. Um, you know, it's I think it's delighted that people um, are um, uh, you know, participate in this because it's it's important, right? You know, energy. There's a lot of specialty specialty skills you need and things that we haven't done before. So, really, we need to be uh, advocates for this uh, with different groups and educate. Um, on an existing facility, much the same. Um, uh, Opportunities and challenges is on a new build. Um, but one thing I would take away from when we've done these workshops is take the incremental approach. You know, if you're remote, an example I use is, you know, let's say we want to put a containerized system. Um, one of the bigger costs are obviously the container, the interconnection, but it's getting the power from the container into the electrical room. So if you're um, remodeling a parking lot and you know that that's going to be a perfect location for your battery or storage, um, put the conduits in between the electrical room and the, or th put some conduits in or think about pathways when you're doing these smaller developments or um, and the other thing is what we have had is um, people have entered into long-term PPAs that you may have a lot of solar on your project but you can't utilize that because that's owned by another PPA um, um, group uh, so same so let me uh, speed up here because I just realized what time is. And in cost, um, you know, Jeff, I don't know if you have anything quickly to add here. All I would say is, um, you know, the, the, there's, a, there's a lot of cost involved in this and in other projects, but you know, I think we're probably, the batteries we bought at Kaiser Richmond, they're, we could buy those now on the market at probably 60% less than what we paid for them uh, four years ago. Um, Jeff, do you have anything else to add on the um, cost? No, that, I mean, I think that's the important point is that the cost of batteries dropping uh, rapidly over time. Yeah, that's been one great benefit. We've seen projects go from from a four or five year uh, simple ROI to down to one and two now. So, uh, yeah, the equipment cost has dropped significantly to, to help that. Great. Thank you. And then, so in summary, you know, we talked about, you know, why even consider these? What are the drivers of change? You know, what is a microgrid? Um, we talked about two examples. One was a critical facility to Kaiser Richmond and also San Benito, which is um, very important to the community, but um, not code required to um, be that way. And then how to apply it. And then and we kind of screwed in on the cost, but we can talk about that in the Q&A. So with that, um, we'll jump to questions. All right, thanks, John and Jeff. Uh, why don't we go through some of these? Um, all right, from Ryan Stoltenberg. Comes a question. He, uh, Ryan asks, "What percentage of the hospital's overall load can be covered by the microgrid, not including the pre-existing backup generator?" So, oh, Jeff, should I take that? Um, no, yeah, yeah, a Kaiser. Was it's kind of an interesting project in that uh, we, we were limited by two factors. Uh, uh, the first, obviously, the, the funding amount um, from the California Energy Commission uh, had its limits. Um, and then also 
the the kind of I, I don't want to say antiquated infrastructure, but but the older uh, um, uh, the main bus capacity of the hospital. Uh, we were essentially limited by the size of amount of power that we could put in. John uh, could speak better to this um, yeah. based on the on the bus rating. So so essentially we we were limited somewhat. So in this case, um, you know, the hospital runs around a 750 kW peak. Uh, all, you know, almost all all day long, um, and and our system can put in interject 250 kilowatts uh, at any at any one time. Now, not not for a full 24 hour period, but it's optimized based on the 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 peak pricing of of the uh, of the utility. So so essentially, we're probably around a 25 to 30 percent uh, recovery for the hospital. Great, thank you. Um, Great. I've I have two quick questions we can rattle off. Um, Malini from Clean Coalition, she's asking if uh, you can repeat the inverter manufacturer name. It was uh, Princeton Power. Great, thanks. And um, and Craig is asking if you could confirm that the solar and battery are DC coupled. Yes, through the three port inverter. Excellent. And um, also from Craig, um, we have another question. Can the solar plus battery keep up the diesel, keep the diesel generator off unless the minimum SOC is reached on the battery? If yes, has there been analysis for how much the diesel fuel can be extended? Um, gosh, those are good questions. So, um, so on the Kaiser Richmond project, <clears throat> um, make sure I answer that question correctly we <clears throat> because this you know the, basically the codes don't allow the microgrid to provide um, emergency power backup um, the only way we can do that is in the event of a uh, failure of the diesel generator that runs out of fuel so we don't um, I guess on the on the San, San Benito project um, Jeff do you know if that yeah, I, has been done you know what? I don't know that anybody's done that analysis, but I think that would be pertinent information to try and at least do some kind of back of the napkin math. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, future. Thank you for that uh, great tidbit of, of information. We should probably figure out how to share that in the future. Uh, Could you just thoughts. say the question? Sorry, Jeff. Can you say that question again? I want to make sure I, I answer it. For the uh... the generator? Oh yeah, you know what? I I've been uh, I I actually erased it, but um, oh don't don't worry. Well, you don't know worry. What? we, we right, can we'll uh, yeah we we generate a list of uh, questions in a spreadsheet so I can send okay. them all, all to you. Okay. Great. Excuse me. I was hastily I I've been erasing them as I go through, but uh, <laughs> all right. I, just to clear okay. them out, I I won't do that again. Um, so. How about EV charging infrastructure? Um, is it added to any of these projects? If so, how did these, how do those affect the economics, especially with respect to demand charges? Bring that question as well. <laughs> there was uh, EV charging added at the San Benito project, but uh, I, you know, I, I, unfortunately, I guess since we've only been in operation for or for for eight weeks or so, um, we don't have information on that, but. Uh, yeah, that that is a great question. Um, I, I couldn't even say how well or how you know if they're actually utilizing the the chargers at the at the facility. I imagine they are. So I'm sure somebody would. But uh, yeah, sorry, I don't have an answer for that. Yeah, well, I could maybe follow on. Yeah, because we do as part of the um, part of our project at San Benito, we're certainly installing uh, EV chargers and. Uh, the same at Richmond, um, you know, Kaiser are are providing some pretty substantial EV charging infrastructure, and I think overall, I think that is a great challenge and also an opportunity. You know, as a EV owner, you know, we're, when you connect an EV, that's a significant load that's going to be added. That um, twenty or thirty EVs that could potentially be the biggest load on a building. Um, but I think also looking forward, and we haven't done that. I mean, tracking that is uh we get it right v to b you know how you know, we have a huge amount of stored energy in these cars and certainly in an emergency situation um 
you know, how can we optimize the use of that? And maybe that, if that's a subject for another presentation um, with the uh, Clean Coalition, I think it's a great challenge, but also a great opportunity. Excellent, thanks. Um, all right, so Ted Tiffany uh, asks, have you experimented yet with optimizing for carbon intensity on the grid versus optimizing for cost yet? Um, I think San Benito, it's early, you know, so we've only just got it commissioned. Um, and uh, certainly at Kaiser Richmond, we have not, but that is a, that is a, that is a great question. Jeff, have you, um, have you no, I don't know. I mean, I can't speak to the. We are still under the uh, uh, controller development, so so we have a team of engineers that are adding, um, you know, ADR 2.0, so automatic demand response, the signals that come from the utility. Um, we have not looked at that, or they haven't, as far as I know of. Uh, but that is a good point to to bring up to them because at some point that may weigh. Uh, heavier uh, have a have a larger value, I suppose, than just your basic economics, utility economics, right? I, I suppose maybe if there's a, a, a advantage to having some kind of carbon credit or something, then that could actually you know benefit more than just the economics of the of the utility fees. Yeah. So maybe if I could build on that, I know Kaiser, uh, they are. Well, I, I hope I get this right. Are all well, well, they've made a a uh, very big push, and I believe they are uh, all their energy they procure is, um, you know, carbon is from renewable sources. Um, and interesting, I'm working with a client in the UK, and they are uh, they actually installed a lot of their demand response was using generators as as a prime source. So now we're now working with them on identifying how um, how we can essentially decarbonize their uh, their systems. Um, so yeah, that's a really great question. Is particularly as we transfer, obviously costs are very important for facilities, but as we transition into how can we decarbonize systems? And and another one point is I'm working on another systems is you know that uh, keep coming back to decarbonization. So we're going to be the electrical loads are going to increase in buildings, and that's a really great question, Ted. Is that um, you know we're going to move from gas water heating, and in certain hospitals, you know, how are we going to move from these huge loads that are provided by uh, gas, you know, and a non-renewable to, um, you know, a renewable decarbonized source. So um, these are some great questions, but also some really fundamental challenges we're going to be facing and we have to deal with to get to uh, um, a fully decarbonized grid or a system. Great, thanks. Um, Melanie from the Clean Coalition asks, um, why can't the microgrid be used to supply the emergency loads and use the existing genset emergency power system as the backup to the backup? Great, great question. Um, uh, so, uh, in a hospital situation, um, the the I think we touched on it before. One, right now, it's not from the codes do not allow that um, from a your code system perspective and you also on the component side anything that provides connection to the emergency power system needs to be in a seismic heat compliant building and it also needs to be um, it also needs to be uh, all the components need to be seismically certified they need to be on a shaker table this building um, whilst is very robust this is not um, you know a hospital needs to be operational after a force a seismic event whereas a um a normal building a b occupancy simply needs to be safe to exit but certainly in the future and then like i say myself and david are we're, we're working at state level to um hopefully get the codes to catch up with the with these needs uh all right great thank you uh why don't we go yeah. with at John Sarda's question, are the EV chargers bi-directional capable for added energy storage? Um, it, Kaiser Richmond, uh, so not Jeff, do you, uh, no, do you know yeah, that? Not, on, not, San not Benito? Kaiser, uh, and currently not at San Benito either. Um, um, yeah, so uh, unfortunately not at this time. 
And uh, John also asks if, if Kaiser is considering developing microgrids at other facilities in the Bay Area and elsewhere. Yes. <laughs> a lot. <laughs> yeah, Kaiser is very committed um, on many of their facilities. Cool. And um, Alice uh, Lapierre uh, asks, I may have missed this, but what kind of batteries were used? What size? What technology? So we, yeah, we may have uh, we've gone over that, but you can just reiterate. Yeah, sure. It's a, some, uh, Kaiser, it's a one megawatt hour lithium ion Samsung batteries. Jeff, what was the... Uh, Actually, uh, yeah, same, same um, Samsung. It's a Samsung SDI um, lithium ion that's also at um, San Benito, and I believe it's like 584 megawatt hours. Yeah. Can I maybe just add one thing to there? Maybe a takeaway is if you're, you know, to avoid demand charges, um, uptime is really important. Um, and, and I think we've had a good experience of working with Samsung from a technical support. And if somebody, if you're looking at when you buy your battery technology, which I'm going to use the term batteries and solar are somewhat a commodity, it's very important to making sure you will get uh, um, on site support in any you know, commissioning or setup. I think that's a really one of our my uh, takeaways from this project. Great, thank you. Um, Malini asks uh, again: um, uh, Can you give a bit more detail on the not auto transfer switch used in the Kaiser Richmond microgrid, like the brand model and capabilities, perhaps? Uh, we can uh, bear with me. So uh, it's a, uh, we use the ASCO. Um, it's actually, it is a seismically certified switch. I'm just trying to find the slide here. Um, unfortunately, I don't have a picture. So it's ASCO, I can't remember the model. Jeff, do you remember the model? Uh, no, not off the top of my head, but I'll call up the submittal sheet. <laughs> Great. Um, Alice Sung is, is asking if there is a case study being written for either project. So, um, Kaiser Richmond, uh, the CEC of Commission Navigant, and that is actually on their website. Uh, I can send out the link to that. And then um, San Benito, I'm sure there is, but we're, we've just we've just gone gone live. Also, uh, yeah, there was. Uh, I mean, just provided by Charge Bliss through the the CEC grant funding. Um, the, uh, they call it the final report, but in, included in the final report is the um, is a case study, and you should be able to find that online um, if you just Googled um, CEC PON 14301, um, and I can supply that information if somebody wants to drop me an email. Wonderful. And uh, Craig is asking, what percentage of the normal loads are the critical loads? Um, oh gosh, it the, uh, the critical loads is around. Uh, I think it Richmond is around forty percent. It Kaiser of Richmond, and then um, Jeff, do you have the San Benito? No, I, I don't know a San Benito, but, but yeah, I would agree with you at Kaiser. And, and the reason we know is that uh, uh, the first Tuesday of every month, they do their generator testing. And the hospital, as I said, ran around 750 to 800 kW and would drop to three, 300 kW um, or 400 kW, which would be just covering the critical loads. So yeah, maybe maybe it's closer to 50%, John, but, but yeah. 40 or 50%. Right. Great. And uh, Craig had, had, had made a comment, more than a comment than a question earlier that I didn't get to yet, but um, this might be a good place to, to, to conclude uh, if, you have any, if you have any comments to this comment. Um, he states that note that the tax benefits are reduced, if not 100%, under 75% from solar means that no tax benefits extend to the battery. So if you have a comment on that, by all means. Jeff, do you want to, uh, <laughs> do you have any comments on that? 
Uh, yeah, sorry, I was looking for the uh, ASCO uh, number. No, I, you know, as that far as the uh, the ITC, uh, because I'm under the impression that the whole battery and solar costs, um, we were able to take the 30% ITC credit. But maybe I, I'm sorry, I, I may have missed the full question. Yeah, if you want, yeah, if you want to send a, a comment through and uh, like that, we can give more specific answers because. Yeah, we, we've both been very engaged in this over the years, so we've got a lot of information we're, we're happy to share. So we can do that in a follow-up note. Perfect. Um, well, this is a great place to start. I, I thanks, thank you both for uh, putting this presentation together and uh, presenting and uh, going through these questions. Um, I just wanted to remind everyone who's still on the call, there's quite a few still on the call, um, that these, we do have a recording of this webinar and uh, we'll be, we'll be uh, uh, John Sarter from the Clean Coalition will be sending a, a link to that to, to view, um, as well as the presentation itself. So thanks again, everybody, and uh, um, you have a great rest of the week. Hey, thank you for the opportunity. Yeah. Here, guys. Yeah, and, and thank you, everyone, and thanks for some great questions. And again, feel free to um, my contact information there, and uh, if you have any specific questions, we'd love to talk to you about your projects and um, share with what we know. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Great job. Talk to you soon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.